thanks, Simon. Um, welcome to the, I suppose, welcome to the, the presentation. Uh, interesting request to take a look at the South African space, particularly given what we've been through. Um, but before we, we dive into that, I guess um, a bit of context is always important and it is uh, welcome so everybody sort of understands uh, who I am, where I fit in and that sort of thing. Um, I'm Jimmy Moyaha uh, at Naboa Capital. We are an alternative asset manager um, focused on alternative assets primarily looking towards things that are going to outlive us all and looking beyond um, what we currently know. Uh, so our focus is uh, around everything from digital assets to uh, alternative investments in things like livestock and that sort of thing. And we're working on tokenization of um, products and assets. Uh, the, the big craze that um, BlackRock and JP Morgan are now on around the tokenization of real world assets is something that we've been um, sort of eyeing for a couple of years since sort of the, the early signs of the pandemic. Uh, the focus was then to look at a different way of doing alternatives or, or different way of investing in general. Um, and then with a particular focus thereafter on alternative assets, but with the aim of providing uh, sustainable returns. Um, I mean, some of the funds that we're working on are uh, ESG funds and, and that sort of thing. So uh, the focus is a holistic focus on alternative assets, but with the view that if we're able to um, achieve tokenization of these assets, we're able to then uh, make them affordable and more accessible to uh, markets. So that's a bit of a nutshell about what uh, Laboa does and how we are positioning ourselves as an alternative asset manager. We are, of course, majority black owned, um, and that will hopefully come in handy one day when uh, you look to make your investment choices. Uh, but getting on to the purpose of this conversation, of course, um, was to take a look at South Africa Inc. Um, and the question is obviously, is there an investment case for South Africa Inc? And if there is an investment case within South Africa, where does it sit or where do the opportunities lie? Um, so we'll take a look at some of the macro uh, environmental factors, both locally and internationally that have been affecting uh, markets and affecting sentiment and affecting um, just how we view uh, investments or how we've viewed investments over the last couple of years. Um, there, you'll see that some of the context goes back as far back as 2019. And this was because we had to deal with three or four, three and a half years of a pandemic and so uh, 2019 is the last comparative base that really makes sense that doesn't seem like it had too much craziness to it. Um, so we've just included that sort of um, view on things as well. Uh, we'll look at some of the dark clouds that still persist within South Africa. Uh, and there are many. Um, dark is obviously a pun on or play on the electricity situation, and that is included in that. Uh, so we'll just take a look at some of the factors that continue to push South Africa away from achieving its objectives or continue to hinder South Africa rather. Um, and they obviously have a, a spillover effect on sentiment around SA Inc. in general as a result. Um, but then we'll also do a bit of a deeper dive into uh, the sectors within South Africa, um, get a bit of an overview of how they've been performing, what we anticipate will happen, what the outlook is uh, from a sectorial point of view, and maybe even touch on um, a couple of key insights within the, the, the various sectors. Uh, and then, obviously, the reason everybody uh, is here is the opportunities. Where do the opportunities lie? What do they look like? Um, is it worthwhile to sit on cash at this stage? Is it worthwhile to look outside of South Africa's borders? I guess just um, an idea of where the mindset is at around various sectors and various opportunities as they may present themselves. Um, so I guess, yeah, kicking off would be around the macro environment. Uh, and I think the the split here is is to look at, there's been a couple of events that, are, that have happened that have then become catalysts to new events that have then led to new conditions. I mean, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, showed us a whole host of what is possible, what is not possible, um, set markets really into a tailspin. And it's basically the the black, the biggest black swan event we've had since the 2008 financial crisis. And the con I mean, considering it a black swan event is, is a hopeful case in that we won't see the things that we saw in, in, in the pandemic. Um, but it did also have a, a macro environment 
conditions that we're having to contend with. I mean, obviously, the trade war as well between the US and China, um, that was around Donald Trump's presidency, and that had uh, a knock-on effect on repositioning China as well in the global space, um, positioning America as well, and, and all of us in between the two, um, geographically and economically. So um, it, it was something that we showed or shed light on uh, a lot of developments with the sanctions that were imposed and sanctions that were lifted in some cases and that sort of thing. And we saw that um, that then had a spillover effect into how we all dealt with the Russia-Ukraine situation when um, Russian sanctions were then imposed. You started to see a different way of, I mean, some countries absorbed that and some countries didn't uh, implement that and that sort of thing. But I think overall, the economic conditions that we've all had to contend with over the last three, maybe three and a half years have been um, as much as markets are able to bear, I, I'd like to think, because if you look at uh, the stress that that has put on the various sectors within local and international markets, it's really been pushing everything to the absolute limits. We've seen um, inflation levels at historic levels, inflation levels at 40 year highs in some countries. Um, and, and it really has been a testament uh, that some of these past factors uh, are the direct um, cause or the direct catalyst for what we're currently dealing with. Uh, but yeah, I mean, things like the stimulus packages that we've seen as well from the US. The US put out a stimulus package for their economy over a trillion dollars uh, that was in an effort to help them weather the COVID storm. But then, of course, there was that recent stimulus of about $400 million that went towards the banking sector when we hit the banking crisis. So Time and time again over the last three years, we've definitely seen that macroeconomic conditions have been um, a far greater influence on price movements, on sentiment, on market uh, responses. And to that extent, it's been whether we're, you're a retail investor, whether you're an institutional investor, uh, you, you've had to take into account a lot more. And I remember a time where uh, Simon and I actually joked about this, saying that uh, Donald Trump being president is probably the worst thing we've had to we, we had to contend with um, in in modern day finance and economics and and that sort of thing. And boy, were we wrong! I mean, that was probably just the tip of the iceberg of things that were then to follow. He was probably the most entertaining thing we had to contend with in markets in recent times. Um, but he certainly wasn't uh, the only thing we had to deal with. And then, of course, the the investment downgrade in South Africa that then had a spillover effect on areas like foreign direct investment and our bonds and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, to where we are now, the, the conditions we're now looking at are things that we also thought were avoidable and things that are still hanging in the air that, um, I mean, the Russia-Ukraine war, I won't go into too much detail around that because we've all had our fair share of having to deal with that and contend with that and um, the hope, of course, is always that, that that war ends as soon as possible and that peace is restored to um, the region. Uh, but it is having an effect on, as we saw in, in, in winter, it had an effect on gas prices, on oil um, supply. We, we've seen OPEC take uh, somewhat of an accommodative stance on Russian supply. We've seen countries like India um, willing to, India and China, willing to buy um, Russian oil despite the fact that uh, Europe and the, U and the West are not necessarily willing to. So um, again, without going into too much detail around that, we've already seen a lot of the impact around the war situation. And at this stage, I think markets are just wanting a peaceful resolution so that we can move forward. Um, and the global recession is obviously going to be the one of the big uh, macro factors that's still at play. I mean, uh, as we said, some of these things were caused by um, what we previously knew and what we previously saw. And in the case of the global recession, I mean, if you look at um, all of the indicators that are still pointing towards this happening. I mean, compare 2008 financial crisis to where we're sitting at the moment, and you see that um, there's, there, there's sort of key indicators that, that take place or that, that come through within the markets that uh, point towards the recession. And we saw the same sort of indicators happen. Um, I mean, simple example are bond yield curves. We saw them invert um, shortly around the 2008 financial crisis. And as a result, what we saw that that was around the time just before the recession hit and, and that sort of thing. So we these sorts of ca uh, typical catalyst type events or indicators in the current case have been going on for more than a year. We came out of the pandemic 
in 2022, almost globally, with the exception of China, of course. And coming out of that environment, the anticipation was very much on um, a recovery. And then there was extreme recessionary concerns. And the recessionary concerns were to the extent that there was a higher probability of a recession in the US and in the UK than there was in South Africa. And that really made us look at markets differently and say, but hang on, what's going to happen with the recession? And as we stand at the moment, we we have the hope that the recession, the recessionary concerns are being avoided at a global level. Uh, we've certainly seen from the US's perspective that uh, they are confident that, or growing in confidence in the fact that they may be able to avoid a recession. Um, and it could be largely based on the fact that they've dealt with this crisis considerably differently to how they dealt with the 2008 financial crisis. So the stimulus packages that we spoke about earlier, um, the, the size of the stimulus on its own is much bigger than anything that they would have, any intervention that would have um, taken place post-2008. So that could be something that could serve the United States economy very well. Um, but as we've seen time and time again, and we've spoken about it, uh, myself and Simon at length as well, is every time we've gotten data points out of the US and other leading economies, it's almost been a hit and miss kind of situation. There was a point where every single data point that came out was a complete miss. The, U the UK has come out to say as well that every single data point that they've been measuring as well, uh, for the majority of the part, has been a complete miss. So it's still very early to tell whether a, a, a global recession has been avoided. Um, and that will obviously then filter through to sentiment around our local recession and our local um, concerns there. But from a global point of view, in addition to the global recessionary concerns, we look at institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that are saying that they're underpinning 2023 growth prospects on China. And to date, China's failed to deliver. China, um, as recently as uh, this week, put out a, um, a rates announcement or let us know that they're cutting back on rates in an effort to stimulate uh, their local economy as well. And even despite that, even despite um, the fact that China is supposed to be the front runner on economic recovery and they've stimulated the economy recently, you're seeing major banks are still downgrading China growth forecasts and growth outlooks for the remainder of the year. So the consensus, at least at an institutional investor level, is very much that these growth targets are still um, not likely to be achieved. And that's obviously going to have uh, implications going forward, implications looking at um, where markets position, where markets realign themselves. Uh, and, and I mean, some of that might be to the benefit of the South African economy, which uh, to, to South Africa's credit has been remarkably resilient and surprisingly resilient um, in the face of adversity and in the face of global uncertainty that would ordinarily um, provide uh, a big risk or kind of environment uh, for, for markets to operate in. I think South Africa has been able to do exceptionally well. Um, the top 40 and the all share both have been able to sort of weather the storm as best as, as possible. And of course, um, the inflationary picture has been something that you that, that can't be ignored uh, whether locally or internationally. I mean, every every country has been battling with inflation. Just this week, uh, the UK put out inflationary numbers yesterday. Their inflation targets are, or their inflation expectations are still out of hand. Inflation came in higher than expected. Um, on South Africa's side of it, uh, we had an excessive or a very aggressive approach from uh, the central bank in curbing inflation. And that seems to have worked because yesterday's inflation pr uh, print came in even better than expected. We expected about a 6.5% read on headline inflation. We came in at 6.3%. So you're seeing that ordinarily countries that you'd expect to be on top of these sorts of situations are struggling and countries like South Africa, where ordinarily we, we would expect to be lumped in with other emerging markets. And, and to the credit of the central bank, we have a very, very firm stance on this inflation targeting and on currency protection. And I think in the long run, we're starting to see that that is shaping out to or shaping up to potentially be to the benefit of the South African economy and the South African picture. Um, obviously, the political pressures that persist uh, are going to persist until the national elections. And in particular, I mean, we'll dig into some of those now because some of those or a lot of those influence the South African picture. Right. So the dark clouds still hang over us, over our heads um, 
around, I guess we start with the political side of it because it affects a couple of these areas, uh, the BRICS summit that's coming up, um, that is very much a contentious topic. And it's as a result of the Russia-Ukraine uh, war, as a result of our affiliation with um, Russia and our history with Russia, but that then also has a large spillover effect um, from a political situ uh, point of view on what it is we do uh, with regards to the AGOA agreement in the United States and that agreement being in jeopardy and that sort of thing. And I think some of the other risks that we see from a political standpoint spill over into fiscal policy as well. So you look at the state of SOEs at the stage, we cannot afford more bailouts. Um, SOEs have been bleeding the economy and the taxpayers' pockets uh, quite dry, and they're not looking to get any better. We've seen a slightly firmer stance from our current finance minister around SOEs and, and no longer wanting to provide significant bailouts and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, they're still having a significant impact on operational capabilities. And when we look at the sectors, we'll dig into that as well. Um, obviously, the unemployment rate in South Africa is ever increasing and always going to be a concern and constantly causing um, a headache from a growth perspective and an outlook perspective. And that too, while we're looking at the growth side of it, I mean, we were forecast, we were forecast initially uh, uh, last year, I believe we were forecast to grow at about 0.9% this year, which was overly ambitious to begin with considering what we were contending with. Um, we since had to contend with stage six load shedding. We um, have revised growth forecasts down to 0.3%, um, down to even 0.1% from uh, the central bank and other institutions as well. So the likelihood of a South Africa, a South African recession before the end of the year is even higher than it was before at the start of the year. And that's obviously going to have an impact on how we view the various sectors and the various players within the sectors. Uh, guys like your financials have proven to be more resilient and recession or recession proof rather, um, and have been a better bank or bang for your buck in times of recession. So we're still very much contending with the realities that we're going to go into a recession at South Africa, despite all of the measures we've put in place, because economic growth is simply not there. The environment for economic growth or the environment for um, any form of stimulus, stimulus within the economy is not necessarily um, something that we can confirm or safely say uh, will come to light. Uh, we've got elections to contend with next year in April or, or so. And looking at that electionary picture or the the um, political situation and how that will affect uh, markets and how that will affect overall sentiment, uh, yes, a lot of that hasn't started to be or to become priced in as yet, but obviously it is going to have a significant effect or impact on the fiscal outlook on the um, overall outlook from a South African Inc. point of view as well. Uh, we can't ignore the the impact that that could have, um, much like we can't ignore the impact that something like um, the grey listing that we went through will have. That's the AML picture on, on the screen. Um, it's, it's difficult to find a picture that says grey listing, um, but the, the, the grey listing concerns uh, coupled with the overall outlook towards South Africa from an international perspective is making uh, it difficult to continue to attract foreign direct investment at um, a significant pace and at a significant level. We've been able and fortunate that um, the world is also contending with those macro factors that we've looked at uh, just now. And that's sort of made the South African picture a little more attractive than, um, or, or had a bit more of a positive effect than an adverse effect. Uh, I definitely won't go into the light bulbs because we've all had more than enough load shedding. But I will say that um, for those that haven't been keeping an eye on the markets, the markets have been performing and, and sentiment uh, around South Africa and the currency risk premiums and the risk premium, the overall risk premium around South Africa has definitely improved. If you look at the last week and a half, maybe two weeks where we've actually had consistent electricity and with the talks around China um, providing solar energy, uh, our electricity minister's recent visit to China and the push towards renewables and what we're doing with Mozambique supplying um, the, the thousand megawatts and still the, potentially the car power ship deal that is still up in the air. 
the energy crisis and energy security aspect of the South African economy is such a big catalyst towards repositioning the economy because all the other factors are um, under control. I mean, the inflation rate and the interest rate side of it, uh, the, fifth, uh, the monetary policy is doing the absolute best that they can with the other factors that they're having to contend with. Yes, it can be argued that inflation targeting at this stage might not be the best approach um, considering a stagnating economy and a potentially recessionary economy. Um, but that's a conversation for another day. I think the fiscal um, structures that need to be implemented and the reforms that need to be put in place are a bigger concern. And things like load shedding, if resolved, would potentially serve South Africa exceptionally well. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that I have been rambling for quite some time. It's... Uh, I'll take a bit of a breather, a bit of a pause here before we look at the, the various sectors that um, we anticipate or, or the view on the sectors. And I think the it, it's also difficult having a look at these sectors in isolation because some of the factors that we spoke about that are local factors, some of the factors that are macro factors at an international level as well, are factors that make it very difficult to start to look at forecasts and outlooks and way forward. So in, in taking the approach to look at the sectors, it's almost one of those things where the concerns listed on the right are just a finite number of concerns uh, relative to each sector. It was just a situation where you you have to almost think what is immediate, what is readily available in terms of information, because as the information starts to come out, whether at a macro level, whether at South African policy reform uh, perspective and that sort of thing, that's going to have a knock-on effect on pretty much everything else, on the sec uh, on the outlook that we then have for the rest of the year. Um, it's interesting that we are pretty much halfway through the year, and if you take a look at the, the performance of the top 40, as an example, when compared to something like the S&P 500, and we'll look at that in a moment, is to say that you're not where we thought we'd be, but the reality is we've had to contend with so much. And I think that was um, leading up to this conversation that was pretty much the consensus was we've had to deal with a lot and having to deal with a lot, where do we then look for a break, a breather, um, signs of hope and signs of life within the South African economy. But again, to the credit of the the all share, the, the JSE, South African companies have been exceptionally resilient. I mean, companies, um, like Spa and Astral Foods that have both reported north of 700 million rand in um, load shedding costs that they've had to bear and incur. And companies like that are still able to operate and still able to deliver. And, um, you know, to, to a certain extent, some are, are trying to shoulder the burden from consumers as much as possible, um, which is another factor we have to look at, whether or not from a consumer side of it, um, we'll be able to, con to, to continue to see companies shoulder those burdens. And I think if you look at the, the, the overviews of each of the sectors, uh, you'll see that from an overview perspective, I mean, I'll, I'll, I won't spend too much time on, on the slide. Uh, the presentation, of course, will be made available so we can discuss some of the other points in greater detail. Uh, but if you look at the manufacturing space, I mean, that's proven to be resilient. We saw that in the latest GDP print that came out, the manufacturing um, sector was the biggest contributor and was the reason we didn't go into uh, somewhat of a technical recession already. So uh, whether or not that'll be sustainable, whether or not we'll continue to see that, I think some of the concerns, I mean, I listed the concerns there around the BRIC summit being the potential for um, foreign investment, the potential for looking at the fact that the BRICS nations want to increase or potentially increase collaboration with other regions and that sort of thing. So that kind of play would very much affect um, where we see the local manufacturing space uh, but also the ability of the local manufacturing space to uh, get export out. We know that, I mean, the likes of um, Ford um, have complained in the past that where it relates to manufacturing in South Africa and the ability to operate in South Africa, the factors that South Africa needs to deal with around the power crisis have been factors that have dampened their outlook on wanting to remain in these markets. They've, they've said that they've invested heavily in the market, but it's it's time for them to then look and say, is that investment going to ever yield fruit? And this is where we start to look at those domestic factors having a bigger impact on these sectors. 
um, the agricultural side, it, it can't be uh, ignored the impact that the AGOA agreement could potentially have, uh, all us being removed from that agreement. Uh, actually, I, 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 let, me, let me not use the word removed. Let me use the word that Minister Patel used and that is graduated from the AGOA agreement. Uh, whether or not we have been or we will be graduated from that or whether we'll be removed simply for our affiliation uh, with Russia and our current political or non-aligned stance on the war uh, remains to be seen. And that is such a significant factor to look at when we look at the agricultural sector and the potential impact that that will have. I mean, $4 billion in exports towards the United States is not a small amount. And if the hope is that countries like Russia will pick up the slack and we'll pick up what we're no longer able to export or benefit from uh, in that respect. I think that is going to leave uh, a lot of concern on the table. Um, and so the agricultural space as well, that risk component um, includes things like uh, transnet, obviously. So maize production levels are increasing. And even if maize production levels uh, hit the levels that we need them to, if we're not able to get that one to port and then two to the export countries like the United States, that's obviously going to have a different impact on how that sector is able to perform for the rest of the year. Um, financial is probably going to be the one area where the, uh, a recession might, um, or the blow of a recession might be cushioned. We've seen that financials have run up considerably at this stage. And so the outlook at this stage, I mean, there's, there's a couple of financial stocks, and the financials are good stocks. Um, the banks have reported the bank's revenues are um, all very well. Um, yes, guys like Standard Bank this week reported that they're increasing uh, provisions for impairments and defaults and that sort of thing. And that's going to affect uh, profitabilities and bottom lines. But what we've seen is that uh, regardless of whether it's a high interest rate environment, low interest rate environment, the banks are going to benefit from their loan books. Um, the, the, the risk of defaults, I think a lot of the banks, South African banks have been able to deal with default considerably well. It's not the first time we've seen elevated interest rate levels in South Africa, and it's not going to be the last time um, by all accounts. Uh, but what we've seen is that South African banks have always been able to deal with high interest rates and minimize the impact of defaults and um, those sorts of things better than some of our more developed counterparts. And th this was the question that, that I was asked um, uh, probably about two or three weeks ago was, um, how is South Africa faring in high interest rate environment where interest rates have gone up almost 500 um, basis points up to this point? And my response was very simple is this is not a new phenomenon for South Africa. This is not uh, a new thing where, oh, suddenly we don't, we don't know how to deal with elevated interest rate levels and all of that. This is Pretty, pretty much a norm for us. It was a shock to um, our developed counterparts like the US, like the UK. And that's probably why you're seeing that they might be taking a bit longer to recover um, and to contend with and contain inflation expectations and inflation um, levels. South Africa is uh, an emerging market. We, th this is a normal day at work for us almost. You know, So um, we're seeing that that's also made the South African picture very attractive where even though we've contended with, um, on the financial side as well, while we're on financials, even though we've had to contend with being downgraded, having our bonds being rated, junk status and all of that, there's still an interest for them. There's still um, a, a level of sentiment that's saying, you know what, the South African picture is resilient and we are still liking this. Um, and whether or not that interest is short-lived as a result of other markets looking a little worse off, or whether or not it's because we're able to provide a very attractive yield. Again, um, the South African picture is one that's poised for greatness. South Africa's um, overall economy and, and the positioning of um, our companies and our stock market, one, on the continent, but two, uh, as an emerging market play, we're not at elevated levels of 100% inflation levels uh, like some of our other emerging market counterparts, uh, our currency strength is a or our currency is able to contend with some level of volatility and show that it's got some signs of strength. So the South African picture is actually a good picture. It's just unfortunately those dark clouds make it a very very difficult picture to see. So foreign direct investors and and traders offshore are in, in times of 
severe risk aversion, which we might still potentially see with a global recession. Uh, the South African picture is, okay, guys, get your things in order, and then we will look at you. Right now, we we want to look at you, but we're not really there, and we, we markets sort of need a bit more convincing on the South African picture. And unfortunately, there's, there's very little you and I can do about it. There's very little the companies in South Africa can do about it because they've done the very best that they can. There's very little that our monetary policy can do about it because they're contending with the, their factors. It is the responsibility of the government that leads South Africa that sets the policies that is supposed to implement um, or create a conducive environment to allow the South African people and the South African markets to thrive. And until they can actively do that, it becomes very difficult to forecast where the bottom is for South Africa, where the good key points are from, from an outlook perspective and that sort of thing. But again, some of our sectors are going to remain resilient. They're going to continue to do well. Uh, the mining side of it, we went through uh, big commodity cycles, uh, and those cycles were almost an extended. So we almost went through, I, I don't want to say two distinct cycles, but we went through uh, a, a big super cycle that then tapered off and then um, retraced and mellowed out and then resumed again. And we're sort of in another mellowing out uh, phase. And I think the mellowing out side of it now is, is largely demand focused, largely centered around um, that Chinese demand that we spoke about and when that demand returns to the market and how that's going to filter through to things. Because right now, and that's kind of why from a, um, a positioning point of view, it's almost a neutral approach towards uh, commodities and commodities type stocks. You look at the likes of Pingela that have had to increase their um, road capabilities to contend with Transnet, but at the same time are not experiencing the uptick in demand that they thought there might be from their Australian acquisitions and their offshore acquisitions um, because they still heavily banked on a lot of the um, consumption being taken up by China, which is pretty much what everybody else in the world has done. So Chinese demand right now seems to be such a big um, piece of the pie or, or, or the puzzle rather than the pie. So a big piece of the puzzle in terms of when we might see um, an uptick, what might spark uh, a surge in global activity. It might even spark us in the other direction. We might see that um, the demand forecasts continue to come down, that we don't meet the growth outlooks and expectations for 2023 as we near the tail end of the year and as activity starts to slow down. So very much on the fence at the moment about um, the mining space. And that's largely from a price and a demand point of view and less from a supply point of view, because we've seen from a supply point of view, companies in South Africa have got stockpiles on stockpiles. They're not um, running short on the ability to meet those um, supply targets or supply requirements if they have to. Uh, it's more around having to contend with higher input costs, um, elevated inflation levels, elevated um, well, elevated inflation levels affecting those input costs rather, and then having to still look at the fact that um, the logistical side of things, uh, I think, and, and if you if you look at the concerns that we've got from every sector, the overriding theme has to be state-owned entities because the impact that Transnet is having on our ability to export is something that cannot be ignored. It's something that has taken such an ugly shape that um, we almost don't know what to do with it beyond just saying, at this point, surely we should just semi-privatize Transnet, figure it out. I mean, we, we, we're we dealing with billions of, of loss, billions of rands of losses. I think the last estimate um, was probably close to about a billion rand a day in economic impact for the South African or for SA Inc. as a result of Transnet not being fully operational. And there is, of course, that um, China component to that as well around the uh, deadlock with the the locomotives and that sort of thing. But China, uh, Transnet sorry, has uh, its own set of problems. They've got governance issues and a whole host of things they need to address, much like ESCOM. And that's why you'll see that from a concern point of view, the sectors are, are not really, um, there's a component of concern that is at a macro level that is external to South Africa. But a lot of it is around getting input costs under control, being able to uh, manage those adequately from a business point of view, at least in the short to medium term, uh, before we start to look at what that's going to mean for, for revenues. I mean, I gave the examples of um, Astral and Spa, 
And if you look at what that means, it basically means companies are now having to reprioritize resources. Guys like um, the uh, TFG, the, the Fashidi Group, they had to go and take 70 to 80% of their revenues off of the reliance on load shedding. And that's as a result of needing to put in place measures where um, you wouldn't have to ordinarily do that if the load shedding situation was under control. If the load shedding situation was under control, um, companies would have been having really good years, really good numbers, and even higher profitability points uh, than we're, what we're seeing now. But the benefit that we are seeing now from an overall point of view and a sector point of view is that markets are contending with the worst. We've we've sort of budgeted and, and expected that if we go back to stage six, um, maybe even stage eight, that we can weather that storm a little better than what was anticipated. I mean, it was the first sort of time we heard of talks of stage 10 to 14. And, and so markets went into a bit of a shock, but we've proven um, from a resilience point of view. Uh, and, and again, from a resilience point of view, if you take a look at the charts, uh, you'll, you'll see that while the top 40 is not, um, hasn't, I mean, we saw nine, almost 10% uh, in the first month and a half, maybe two months of the year. And since then we've come down significantly. Um, we're closer towards that 70,000 points mark than we are to all time highs. We might even have tapped 70,000 uh, today. Um, but if you look at the the picture on, on the top 40, it, it speaks to, um, yes, we're contending with a lot. Yes, that's, there's a lot that we have to deal with. But despite that, we're still at all-time highs. We're still trading near all-time highs. The impact that all of the conditions we've had to contend with has had on our stock market has been less than what people may have anticipated. So you you take the top 40 and you contrast it with something like the S&P 500, where uh, the S&P 500 started off the year slowly, is building up momentum. Right now, it's probably up about 15 to 16% year-to-date. is showing that it's going to have a big year um, coming off of a very bearish year. Uh, that picture sort of looks more appealing. And if you look at the the charts, I mean, you've got a, I think the, the silver line on both is a 50-day moving average. You see that the gradient on that 50-day moving average, as well as the 200-day moving average, which is the, the yellow line at the bottom, both in both cases, the gradient is sharper or steeper um, on the S&P 500 side, pointing to the fact that that's likely to outperform the local picture. I wonder how that picture will look. And I, I think the anticipation or the view is very much that if we got our local conditions or our local dark clouds under control, we could we could achieve a similar gradient. We could achieve um, a similar outlook or performance from our local stocks because, as I said, they are very, very well poised and very, very well positioned to contend with the difficulties that they've had to contend with. And they've been able to continue to deliver in that space. Um, I think we are just on time. Um, we're getting through to the nuts and bolts and the juicy bits. And this is probably where everybody is interested is this is where the task was. Um, where are the opportunities? What are we looking for? What does it look like? How do we make money? Um, <laughs> where are the areas that we want to be looking at or should be looking at and what areas might be protecting us from, from certain things. I think if you have to look at the overall SA picture, obviously you wanna be looking for undervalued stocks. You wanna be looking for um, stocks that could potentially have been oversold where uh, markets were just a little too harsh on them uh, considering other factors and saying that, and it was less of a reflection on the performance of the stock or the value of the stock and the net asset value of the of the actual company and more around sentiment is really poor in your sector, in your industry and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously the recession proof uh, things are something to consider at this stage considering uh, where we are positioned from growth prospects and a stagnating economy. So that's an area where you might wanna be saying, let's at least incorporate some element of um, investment that is not going to be exposed to or not going to be negatively impacted by recessions or as negatively impacted as some of the other sectors, right? Um, there are companies on the JSE that have 
great balance sheets. I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of Afrimat, who recently spent a billion acquiring um, Lafarge. Uh, that was this week alone. Uh, guys like um, Capital Appreciation, who have strong cash reserves, very low debt levels, that sort of thing. Obviously, you want to be looking at which sectors these guys play in and balancing out your portfolio from that point of view. Um, and that's why the, the portfolio weightings become a consideration as well and, and how you then look at positioning. So are we positioning for the remainder of 2023? Are we positioning for 2023 to 2025 to 2027? Um, time horizons obviously start to become a, a consideration at this point as well, because the reality is there's some stocks that are trading at year-to-date lows, but there are also some stocks that are trading at all-time lows, where you can clearly see that a bounce from this sort of level is likely to be a bounce you will never repeat, uh, or you'll never really come back to these levels. So um, also a consideration to look at and, and possibly say, maybe some of them might be worth a punt at certain levels, might be worth uh, limited downside risk and, and potential upside, but also some of them you don't want to hold for too long. So some of them have um, much smaller windows to upside uh, and might hit points of resistance a lot uh, sooner than anticipated. So I think the, the overall sense from an opportunity base and an opportunity perspective at this stage is very much um, a cautioned approach, uh, a disciplined approach, and having a look at uh, the considerations that we've had to deal with. So this is why when we looked at the macro picture, it was as far back as 2019. So factors that developed in 2020, 2021, 2022 might not be factors that are with us going forward, but they may have created new conditions where um, you're seeing increased levels of demand in elasticity in markets like consumer goods, where necessities are there regardless of whether inflation is at 12% uh, or interest rates are at 12%, sorry, and inflation is at 6.3%. Uh, 6 so mm -hmm. some areas of opportunity um, present themselves a little differently. And I think what's, what's interesting on the, on the portfolio weighting and the balancing side of it all is if you look at where markets are sitting now, the last five months of performance, uh, if you had had your portfolio weighted 60% bonds, 60% equities, you would have actually had a stronger performance from that uh, distribution than if you had had so 50-50 weight distribution and that sort of thing. So that becomes um, an interesting inflection point to look at going forward. Uh, now that we now see that uh, some of these factors are going to be with us a lot longer, some of the factors um, might dissipate as we go into the rest of the year. Um, if we start to get things under control from an inflation standpoint, what does that do for bonds? What does that do for bond yields? Um, interest rate levels, are we going to see interest rate cuts, those sorts of things. I mean, the MPCs come out to say they don't envision interest rate cuts for the rest of the year. But if we see a sharp drop in inflation down to the midpoint of 3 to 6%, because the economy simply is too constrained and there's not enough growth from the demand side of it, then you can you could very realistically see um, surprise movements needing to be uh, taken into account or surprise adjustments needing to be taken into account. As it stands, um, I know Simon's already got a prediction that uh, the anticipation uh, or the prediction that inflation rather will come through below 6% in the next read. And if that does happen, it'll be perfectly timed with the rates announcement um, in July. So if we do come below 6%, we're well now suddenly we've gone from 7% or 7.2% 7, 7 inflation levels to being inside of our targeted range of inflation between the 3 and 6% range. Yes, on the upper end of the range, but inside of a range in a time frame that we never thought was going to be possible. Realistically, when the Saab initially outlined their forecast, we had anticipated that we were only going to come back to below 5 um, or below 6% towards the last reading of the year, around November or so um, in that respect. And if we come through now as soon as July, it could potentially be um, a good time to set us up for a stronger end to the year and a stronger start to, to next year. Um, which, of course, will have implications on some of those other factors like the elections and those sorts of things. I mean, political parties will say, look, the economy has survived, vote for us, those sorts of things. But the, the, the structuring of opportunities at this stage is very much a cautious, don't rush into it simply because you don't want to miss out on price movements. And if you're going to um, make those decisions, make 
tactical and strategic decisions um, with a view to say we can always rebalance in December, we can always rebalance in April after elections. There's still a greater time to, to be able to take advantage of opportunities, especially if you've got um, a view to say that we're now looking towards the next five years, the next 10 years and that sort of thing, or the next bull market run, uh, which on average lasts anywhere from, from eight to 12 years. So it's, it's very much um, a weighted approach at this stage. And within the last sort of five minutes, I'm going to give out some picks. Uh, Sabanye, we have been a fan of Sabanye for a long time, considered very, very uh, good stock, diversified mine, and I think that's the big play on it is the diversification across uh, metals and commodities and the ability to um, perform well regardless of, I mean, other mining counterparts, you're still stuck with that. I mean, if you take Goldfield Harmony as an example, you've got that concentration risk of um, the one commodity type. So diversified mining approach, very much um, a win. Renogen, anyone that knows myself and Simon, we've been punting Renogen since the dawn of time. Um, <laughs> uh, Stefano Morani and the guys have done really well with proof of concept with phase one. Phase two is now funded. Uh, or starting to get funded. They've got the first $750 million in. If we see Renogen list, the stock could potentially do amazingly well for your portfolio over a longer term period. Uh, government bonds at this stage, we're looking at the uh, 2030 bond uh, expiring in, of course, 2030. Uh, currently providing you, I think, uh, around a 4% return net of inflation. Uh, and, and that, at the moment, is looking somewhat attractive if you have to consider Again, a longer term approach and the fact that even at elevated interest rate levels, you're still returning something uh, good on, on the stock. Um, African Rainbow Capital, liking African Rainbow Capital because it is a, f a financial fintech kind of play. We don't have too many of them in South Africa. Um, the exposure to Time Bank, the exposure to Time Bank offshore as well. As we said earlier, banking stocks have run quite considerably. They are still very, very good stocks. I can't emphasize that enough but we've seen that they've run up in some cases north of 10% um, in the last month and a bit. So maybe worth looking for a bit of pullback on some of the banking stocks, especially if we anticipate that we'll go into a recession. You might see banking stocks uh, that are at near highs pull back a little bit. We go into a recession, they dip and then go and break those highs and create new highs before the end of the year. Very real possibility when we're contending with recessionary fears and considering where banks are positioned in that space. Um, Pepco, absolutely love the assets within Pepco. We won't go into um, all of the other things that have happened in the past with um, the business and other companies and that sort of thing. But Pepco is uh, somewhat of a strong performer, very good, um, as I said, assets within the portfolio uh, are very well positioned. Uh, very, they've been on an expansionary drive if they continue in that respect. Um, they're not hitting big um, luxury goods markets as yet. And so uh, the anticipation there is that they're a good play for the everyday Jimmy, the everyday Simon. Uh, growth point, that's an interesting one that we've added to um, potential opportunities. Uh, and the reason behind that is there's been a greater emphasis on a return to office uh, growth points. Other portfolios have been doing exceptionally well from a recovery standpoint. Where they have lagged has been the office recovery. And if we start to see companies impose more um, days in the office and that sort of thing, you could see that their uh, their properties start to show increased occupancy levels and that sort of thing is very, very uh, weirdly positioned at the moment. I mean, 12 Rand per share having come off of 2020 levels around 20 Rand a share could provide a very good opportunity, even if it's just up to that 20 Rand level before um, having to reassess or even up to the 16 Rand level before having to reassess um, I mean, between 12, let's say 12, 1250 to 1650, 30% uh, increase um, on the current price. And, and that, that could be something you could be looking at. Uh, City Lodge has been a favorite for quite some time. Uh, my personal favorite, uh, so I know Simon's liked it on occasion. I know David Shapiro absolutely loves it as well. I think the company is well positioned within the market. Guys like Sun International are have, have given an indication that they're not going to slow down on or come down on pricing. They're going to continue to offer um, pricing on the upper end of, of um, segments. And you're seeing that from a travel and a business point of view, City Lodge provides a very attractive 
um, sort of play there. We have seen that the stock has struggled to get back above that six rand level. I mean, I've been giving out the stock since it came down to four rand, three rand, eighty. It's still in that below that five rand level. So uh, very much a slow burn if you're going to get involved here. Uh, Toho Sun Limited, loving Toho Sun Limited because of its uh, casino play. They proved to be very resilient through COVID, came out and have been recovering quite well. They also coincidentally happened to own 10% of City Lodge, which Simon and I discovered uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that is interesting that they're on the same page. Uh, a couple of other notable mentions, uh, spoke to Omnia and Afrimat executives this week, really liking what the businesses are doing. Uh, pick and pay could be your retail play at this stage. Um, if you are looking at, obviously, ShopRite having the access to greater parts of its value chain means uh, a lot more, but ShopRite has run quite hot. Um, and if you anticipate that uh, markets might still have a bit of cooling off, uh, pick and pay could be a good potential. Um, you you look at the likes of, of Woolies and Mustek. I mean, Woolworths has run up, I think, this month alone from 60 Rand is uh, around 70 Rand. Uh, we're seeing 80 Rand as a bit of a resistance point, so not much upside there. Maybe wait on that stock a bit. Mustek is at six, 16 Rand. Good ICT play uh, at 16 Rand. Not seeing anything beyond 18 to 20 Rand at this stage. It would be interesting to see how that develops. Um, and this is the parting shot. This is the ace. If you are too lazy to go look at all the stocks and you just want to close your eyes, uh, pick one product. This is a recently listed AMC, which is an actively managed certificate. So where we typically saw ETFs and um, other types of bundled products in the past that were managed in portfolios in the past, um, they were not necessarily actively managed. Uh, this is uh, an actively managed certificate out of our very, very good friends at Unum Capital. Um, the Quadmatic SA equity portfolio, uh, again, like the actively managed component, the, the passive side of it, the fact that it aims to compete with the top, uh, I think, top 80 plus shares on the JSE and outperform um, them as a bundle. Uh, and obviously, Lavoie Capital being uh, the alternative asset manager that we are, it has got an AI component and we do love the next gen kind of element to it. Um, one of the very few AMCs that are out there. Uh, and really, this if you're not going to go look at individual stocks and you just want to close your eyes, put your money down somewhere, uh, potentially see what this could look like. You'd probably be in a good position to speak to um, this, this type of setup. Uh, speaking to that, we are very, very happy to help speak to us. Um, we are, of course, uh, as I mentioned, as an asset manager, category two regulated asset manager by the FSCA. Um, and I think the qualifying statement that I need to then close out the uh, presentation with, because I realize I have run out of time, is that um, the comments and the opinions that were expressed in this presentation uh, were merely our viewpoints on markets and our outlooks on markets. They do not constitute advice. Um, please do not take them as advice, rather take them as what was in our brains that we have provided through as our insights. Um, and if you would like to obtain advice and um, see how we can assist in cultivating your portfolio and growing your portfolio, please, by all means, reach out.